and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Catherine. I'm the Faci Facilities and Sustainability Manager at the Living Coast Discovery Center. Thank you for joining me for week three of our compost workshop series. Um, today, uh, we are going to be going over uh, the maintenance of compost piles and sifting methods. So this is going to be kind of the end stage process for some of your compost piles, maybe after um, a month or two has gone by, you may have some finished compost that's ready to sift. So I'll show you some different methods that we have here in the Living Coast Compost Demonstration Garden. While we're waiting for more people to join us today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Living Coast composting programs that we hold on site. So of course right now we are currently closed, but usually every Sunday at 2 p.m. I hold this on-site composting workshop. Uh, it's included with the cost of admission to the center. Um, but you can see everything hands-on. You can even turn a pile with me, see some things up close, get your uh, questions answered. And the workshop itself takes about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how many people attend the workshop and what type of questions we have. Two of us, the residents who attend my on-site composting workshop are eligible to buy discounted soil saver bins from the city of Chula Vista. So if you are a Chula Vista resident, when we're back open to the public, come on by, take my workshop, and then you can purchase a discounted soil saver bin from the city of Chula Vista. Now, if you're interested in learning a little more about composting, we do have the uh, Master Composter training course. This is a seven week hands-on course that is also free thanks, you to, uh, thanks to the City of Chula Vista Environmental Services. You don't have to be a Chula Vista resident to attend the Master Composter Workshop. You can be from any other uh, cities within San Diego. Um, but if you're interested in joining other students, we take about 35 every class. Uh, you spend about the first hour outside in this demonstration garden building piles with the class, uh, other classmates, turning them every week and working directly with instructors like me. And then we have another hour to an hour and a half session in our auditorium where we have different guest lecturers talk about different uh, composting topics. So it's a great well-rounded course. You get to hear from a lot of different people and see their perspectives about composting. Um, that's pr uh, my favorite part of the course. I learn something new every time. But if you're jo just joining us for week three of our compost workshop series, welcome. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump in today to our piles just for the sake of time. If at any point during this video there's some terminology that I may be throwing out there that you might not be aware of, <coughs> you can ask in the comment section below or just look back to the first two videos of this series uh, so you can learn a little bit more about like the SDI and the ingredients like our greens, browns, and blues. But remember composting is as easy as taking food putting it in a pile and making soil. Um, I actually just did a big uh, harvest out of the garden behind me here. Um, it's very, very fruitful right now. Uh, and it's because a few weeks ago, I did apply some worm castings to the garden. I hope you can hear me okay. It's starting to get a little windy. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and go over to our very first pile that I built in week one and that I also added to last week off camera. But let's take a quick look at the temperature. So the day after, so last Monday I took a peek, this pile was at 130 degrees. Today it is at about 101 degrees, so it's cooled down a little bit. And this will be the first time that I'm turning this pile. So if you remember, when we were talking about our greens, blues, and browns, which are the ingredients of the compost pile, you might remember me saying um, blues can be air and water. So air is very important so that your compost pile smells like earthy soil. It doesn't smell like rotting um, food waste. If you do have a very stinky pile where it's very wet and slimy, then you're going to want to definitely turn your pile. And when I say turn your pile, let's see if I can get a good angle here. I'm by myself, so I am my own cameraman. <laughs> um, but when you do turn this pile or air it out, right, we usually get a, a pickup in temperature because the bacteria have been, pr been provided with oxygen 
and they kind of kickstart their processes. So I am doing that today for the first time. So this is two weeks that this pile was built and we then add material. So the material that is inside this pile, I can still tell what it is, right? I can still see some avocado, uh, avocados, apples, lettuce. I can still tell what a branch is, stuff like that. So not much has completely decomposed yet, just a little bit. But by providing more oxygen, mixing up the ingredients, kind of taking apart clumps, will help speed it up. So, <clears throat> I am getting a little bit of a food odor. It's nothing too crazy. It's kind of what is expected. But um, I'm just uh, dampening that first layer of browns that I turned over. Okay. So you might ask, how often should I turn this? Because this kind of looks like a lot of work, right? So for a pile that sits on the ground, like this um, bio stack here or any other container, the most you want to turn it is every five to seven days. Now that, however, is for um, a really fast rate of decomposition. So if you are trying to compost in a quick time period, you're going to want to turn at least once a week. Now for most households though, once a week is probably a lot of work. You probably are not accumulating that much food material over the course of that week. So for a household, maybe every couple weeks or once a month would be a good option. Sometimes you, I mean, not sometimes, but it's not always required to turn a pile too. You can build the compost pile layer by layer over time. As the materials break down, the pile will get smaller and smaller. So you can continue to add on your layers. Now, if you do it that way, which is perfectly fine, you're doing a cool composting method. So your pile might not get to a very high heat, um, like up to the 130 range for a long period of time. And remember last week I was telling you that at 130 degrees, seeds break down. So if you have a compost pile that you built and you're just adding layers over time and not turning it, just be aware that not all of your fruit and vegetable seeds or plant, other plant seeds will be fully broken down in a cool compost pile. The heat is what helps break down the seeds. Let me see what we have here. Okay, so I turned about half of this pile. Let me actually let me change the setting view here for a minute. So you can see the material here still not fully broken down, but it's kind of mixed up, especially here too. Paper, I see a lot of the spent grains from the brewery, the brew, beer brewing process. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what it looks like for week two. So if you were do, uh, building a compost pile with me and you're turning your pile, this might be what it looks like. I'm going to add a few things in here and then we're going to take a look at some other areas um, <clears throat> just for the sake of time. Um, but now I'm going to add some fresh, well not so fresh, <laughs> but greens. Do we remember what the greens were? These are the nitrogen rich products. Okay, so these are your fruits and veggie scraps, your coffee grounds, tea leaves, plant trimmings. This is some stuff that I brought from home that I froze for the past two weeks. Um, and I have some yellowing leaves from the garden that I'm gonna put in there. Okay. Just gonna mix that up. So when you're turning your pile, you wanna always make sure you're fluffing up your pile. Okay, you never wanna compact the pile. Cause when you compact the pile, we're closing off the air pockets for our FBI. And when you do that, you often get stinky pockets. And 
in a slower composting process. Okay, so if I were to continue going on with this, I would add some browns. Today I have um, some dried leaves, twigs, some stuff that I raked up in the garden. So I'm still doing my 50-50 ratio of greens and browns. Okay. So remember though, as you continue to turn your pile and add your ingredients, you should always put a dry layer of browns on the top so that we don't have as much flies and bad odors. Okay? So this was our pile from week one. Now, if you want to see what the pile looks like a little further along in the process, I started turning this one. This compost pile, I have been keeping it going now for almost, gosh, maybe three years now. And what's really great about composting with a bin like this is that you can continuously feed your compost pile, add new ingredients, and as material gets dark brown and rich like this, like this colors that you see here, you can then sift out the finished compost and then keep whatever needs to still break down, like twigs, bigger stuff like that. You can leave it in the pile and let it continue to break down and then add new greens and browns and then just kind of keep the process going. So that's one method. Um, now, once you get to the finished stages of compost, which can vary, it can take anywhere from two to three months. If you're uh, turning your pile regularly, it can take up to six months. If you're just turning it every once in a while, and it can take anywhere up to eight to 12 months if you are doing a very uh, passive, cool composting method. Now, once you get to the end stages of composting, you might want to know, how do I get all that finished soil? So we have a different, uh, some different methods here. This is a sifter that was um, made by a Living Coast volunteer. And uh, <laughs> this volunteer actually got tired of having to bend over a wheelbarrow with a sifter screen on top because it hurt their back. So what they did is they took um, some uh, old pieces of wood that we had lying around, some scrap pieces of wood. And then this we always had here in the garden. This is from a bicycle um, wheel here. And we just added some chicken wire, our hardware cloth. You can choose what size you want. Um, this wider screen here is great for a, a, a chunkier compost. I like to use it more as mulch. Um, but this is great, especially if you have back problems um, or it's hard to lift things high, if you have like a shoulder problem. Um, this could be a good option for you. So I just roll it around like this. It's a little hard to do one-handed. And finished material will fall through. And I can use all that material down there in the garden. Now, if you have something like this lying around the house, which you might have, like an old trash can and lid. This is another way you can sift. Um, we, we just drilled some hole or cut the lid off of the trash can, drilled some holes there. And then this one here is a finer screen um, that I have. I have two different sizes. So I can double screen if I want by putting them right on top of each other. I'm gonna go ahead and place you guys down for a minute. So, you can see me, okay. So I pulled some finished compost from a compost pile that has um, been sitting now for about a month and a half. So the compost has time to cool down or cure, what some, might, um, what some people might call it. And now I'm gonna sift out some material um, and see what we get. And because the material is a little wet, I'm gonna put some gloves on just so I don't get anything dirty later. But um, you might ask, 
is it necessary to sift your compost? Um, the, the answer is it depends. Okay. So if you are putting in your fruits and veggie scraps without taking off the stickers that are on there, those will not break down in your compost pile. They have a plastic coating on it. So um, it would be great to sift your compost so that you can pull any inorganics out like that. Um, in our office setting, you know, many people use the shredders and sometimes we get credit cards or paper that has glossy coating on it and that gets um, contaminated in the compost pile. So I sift and I pull that out. But that's because we work in an office and there's many people using our shredder. So I can't really control that. But I'm doing, I'm trying this double screen first. So you see, we have bigger material um, that needs to still break down. And it's usually things like the browns or carbon rich material. So this was a bamboo utensil. I have twigs, mulch. So all this stuff needs a little bit more time in the compost pile. So I'm gonna throw it in back into this bin. And this stuff, I'm gonna run through the screen one more time, but you can see it's very rich, dark brown. This is the stage at which you wanna sift your compost. So you can use your hand, run it through the screen, whatever you prefer. Okay, and let's see what I got. I got some good stuff in here. So we're gonna close up. Uh, this is some finished compost that I can apply in the bin. Remember, if you are uh, if you're sifting from a hot compost pile, make sure you let your compost it out for a little bit to cure so that the temperature cools down. Now if you apply your compost while it's 130 degrees still and you sifted, that might mean there isn't there's some finished product or excuse me, that might mean <laughs> that there is a material that still needs to compost. So if you apply it in your garden and it still continues to compost, it can create some heat in your garden too. So you don't want to stress out your plant by doing that. Let's see if there's any questions coming in. So what do I use to sift through? So I just use hardware cloth. You can purchase this from uh, Home Depot, Lowe's. You might need to enter of Walmart or Target. Um, but you can use three quarter inch screen quarter inch. Just remember um, the, the smaller the compost is going to come out. So that's great to use in potted plants and to apply on top of your garden beds. And then if you use thicker material or wider screen like this, the material that comes out is still a little bit chunky, but it can be used as mulch or mixed in your soil. So those are some sifting methods. You can definitely um, look online for do-it-yourself YouTube videos on how to make sifters. There's a lot out there. Um, so next though, I do want to show you, I saw a question from last week. We started our worm bins, our vermicomposters. Um, but somebody asked, how do I, how do I harvest the, the worm casting from the worms without harming them. Now with worm composting it's a little bit more of a tedious process for sifting but what's really great is that you only need a little bit of this worm casting, right? It goes a long way. Uh, it has very high nitrogen content so you often want to dilute this before you even apply it to your plant. But what I did is before the video started I made these little mounds of worm casting so if there was any worms in these piles, theoretically they should have traveled to the bottom because they don't like the sun or light. Um, but I did pick comp uh, casting from my compost bin or worm bin, excuse me, that, that the worms are no longer really in. 
So what I do when I feed my compost pile, uh, my worm compost bin, I feed one side for a couple months and then I start putting food on the opposite side of the bin so the worms travel to that uh, food, food source and then they leave their castings. So that's kind of what I got going on here. I'm going to use a colander uh, sifter like this just to move that material through. And if there were worms, I would be able to click, uh, pick them out at this point. And I set them aside, and then I will actually put the worms back into the worm bin. So remember, we use red wiggler worms to compost our food scraps. Remember, the red wigglers have a voracious appetite, so they'll continue to eat. So if a few worms make it through your sifter and into your garden, it's not the end of the world. But you kind of want to leave those red wigglers in your worm bin so that they can do the composting job for you. Okay, so any big chunks, some stuff that was left over, use and boom, here we go. It's like coffee grounds almost. This is nice rich worm um, usually what I do is, if I wanted to, this size bin is actually a good bin to work with, but I would put these castings in a cheesecloth or old pantyhose and basically make like a tea bag and steep that tea in a, a bucket of water with an air stone in it for a day. And then we create this rich fertilizer, li uh, liquid fertilizer that I can apply to my plants. So that's one way that you can stretch your worm castings or vermicompost a long way in your garden with just a small amount of product. Now, if you have a tumbler, which is what we were going over last week, if you lived in an apartment with a porch or you didn't have a backyard space, the process is very similar uh, with the sifting. Now, remember when you're turning those bins, they're back there. <laughs> Um, but when you're turning them, you want to turn them a little bit more often than we would do the bins that sit on the ground. So if you remember me saying earlier, every five to seven days is how often you should turn a bin that sits on the ground for the ra fastest rate of decomposition. For a, soil, uh, for a tumbler bin though, every three days or so you should go out to your bin and give it a few spins. Remember it sits above the ground, it's in a sealed container with a few air holes. Um, so it needs a little bit more oxygen, uh, a little more help, and it can get really wet in those bins too, so it's important to air it out, turn it, and mix in brown. Uh, but when you are sifting from a tumbler, very similar process, once it's dark brown, rich in color, dark brown color like this, it smells earthy, can't really tell what material it is anymore, uh, throw it on your sifter. Now when I do tumblers though, I have a second bucket next to me. So as, as I scoop it out, throw it on the sifter, move it through, the, the, the material that's still not finished on top, I'll put in a bucket to the side until I'm completely done pulling everything out of my uh, tumbler. And then I'll put that unfinished material back in and then add my new stuff, my new greens, my new browns, and I mix that up and I just keep going. All right. So, <clears throat> if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comment section below. Uh, if you're just joining us, my name is Catherine. I'm Facilities and Sustainability Manager at the Living Coast Discovery Center. We're a nonprofit zoo and aquarium in Chula Vista, California. And uh, remember, if you want to learn more about composting, if you're just joining us today, thank you so much for joining us. But remember, you can go back to our video section um, on our Facebook page and look up our compost workshop series. So you can learn more about how to build a uh, start a pile from the very beginning. That's what I uh, went over in week one. I also went over what the FBI are, our fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates, as well as our ingredients of the compost pile or our compost recipe, which are our greens, browns, and blues. The greens are our high in nitrogen content material often wet. Um, the browns are high in carbon material, often on the dry side, and then blues are air and water.
Uh, week two, I went over composting with a tumbler and how to make your own worm bin or vermi compost. So, so tune in for tune into video number two for more information on that. And um, it looks like we're going to wrap up today. Oh, Wendy asks, can cupcakes be put in the compost? Good question. With with very sweet uh, pastries and cakes and stuff like that, frosting even, I tend to keep that out of the compost pile. Um, the sugary uh, content can attract a lot of ants and just really slow down the compost process. Now if, you know, if a one or two cupcakes make it into your bin every once in a blue moon, it's not the end of the world. They'll still break down. I just don't recommend putting in a lot of cupcakes. Most of the time though, the wrappers that uh, come around the cu uh, cupcakes, as long as they're not the glossy or foil, excuse me, ooh, I had a bug fly into my face there. Um, as long as it's not the glossy or foil cupcake covering, then it can be compostable. Same thing goes for um, plates and <coughs> bowls that um, are disposable as long as they don't have a glossy coating you can really feel it uh, you can compost that material as long as it's not too oily um, let's see barry asks do you use night crawlers too i'm assuming that means for vermicomposting i have personally i've used ni night crawlers in the past um, they're very big but i've noticed that they don't live as long as the red wigglers do so um, I get my Red Wigglers from City Farmers Nursery, but you can definitely order them online. Uh, just do a quick Google search and that would be the best for this time since we're all staying at home isolating. But Red Wigglers can work. Or excuse me, night crawlers. <laughs> Alright, if there's any questions, let me just check here. Alright, doesn't look like it. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me for week three of our compost uh, series. I will see you next Sunday where we'll, we'll be going over some really, really passive composting methods. So if you um, have been watching me working out here and you're just kind of like, that's great and all, but that's a little too much for me or I'm not really interested in doing all that physical labor, um, next week I will definitely be going over some methods that you can do that... Um, will help improve your soil and help improve the earth. All right, thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye.